Welcome to Doctors at Work. My name's Matt Daniel, and this podcast is about doctors' careers. It's part of my mission to help others create successful and meaningful careers. Today, I'm having a discussion with Sarva Chowdhury, and we're talking about what a career in occupational medicine is like. He tells me it's a very varied specialty, which draws on a range of skills, particularly problem solving, negotiation, and report writing. Much practice occurs outside of the NHS, and the routes into the specialty include both NHS and training outside of the NHS. It's one of the few areas of medicine where doctors get to spend 45 minutes or longer talking to a patient, and his career allows him to practice medicine whilst at the same time working with many different non-NHS contexts and thinking outside of the box. Welcome, Sarwar. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Hi. Um, so uh, I am uh, my my native country is um, Bangladesh, but I was born in England. I've been a doctor now for over ten years, based in kind of London area, um, and um, I'm an occupational health doctor and a medical director. So today we're talking about occupational health. What is mm-hmm. occupational health? So occupational health is, in simple terms, the relationship between health and work, um, health and safety at work. So it it combines what we call occupational hygiene, which is kind of workplace hazards and how it affects the body, but also underlying health conditions that affect work. So health and work, work on health effects. Um, but also there's a lot of ethics, there's a lot of law and legislation. So it's quite a nice little blend of, of those kind of four factors, occupational hygiene, medicine, ethics and law. Um, and it's its own specialty. And it, it sounds quite different to most of the maybe sort of general practice or hospital pathway, because, you know, most of us spend all our time being doctors, but you, you've outlined an awful lot of stuff that isn't necessarily medicine. Yes, no, absolutely. And I, I, I think, um, you know, although, uh, you know, our experience most, uh, you know, most of us with occupational health would be just to make sure that we've had our immunizations before we start a, a hospital rotation. But actually, it goes well beyond that. And some of you who are listening may have had some experience with occupational health where there's been an issue with a health and work or work on health issue, or there's a, a requirement for advice with adjustments for working. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 non-treating specialty um, but at the same time you you are still using all the medical knowledge from day one medical school all of your experience um, and you know we talked about GP just there but there are other specialties like psychiatrists and stuff that do go into occupational health and that you know any any health experience any medical practice experience is very useful um, and, and uh, you know surgeons make excellent occupational health physicians as well um, so yeah it's it's um, slightly different and you have to think kind of differently and hopefully we'll go into some of that today um, but at the same time the great thing about it is that you're not completely out of your comfort zone and not using your medical knowledge you are still doing that and every day um, parts of my work I am still doing history taking and you know doing doing what, what, what most of us would be doing anyway it's just in a different manner and from a different angle yeah Let, let's start at the beginning then so what attracted you to occupational health so um yeah i mean for, for me matt my my career um you know started kind of um you know part of, went through medical school at barton of london in east london um graduated 2012 and i was kind of going through the motions that most of us do with fy1 fy2 and then i suppose most of us at around fy2 need to start thinking what we're going to do for the next 25 30 40 years of our life which is actually a really difficult thing to do um so what i did is i started to locum a little bit and just wanted to feel kind of let's say different specialties a little bit psychiatry a little bit of a pediatric surgery a little bit of rehab medicine you know and I did a a, a variety of kind of rotations let's say um and did a bit of traveling and just wanted to get an outside perspective because there's more to life than work um but also I just didn't know what I wanted to do um I think some of us kind of default towards GP and maybe maybe I'm uh, wrong maybe there are a lot of us that are listening that I really want to be a GP but I feel that a lot of people I speak to and especially colleagues I have um, do GP because it's let's say the easiest way to CCT in a few years but also to try to get that work-life balance and actually what I found is actually I didn't really want to do that and I felt that actually there's other specialties that could 
lead me to get that work-life balance where I'm doing more nine to five. I'm earning a very decent salary and I'm still using my knowledge. I'm still being consulted, so to speak. Um, and also, you know, just, just get engaged. I still wanted that interaction with people and you know history taking um and uh you know to just kind of generally try to help people although it may not be treating you know occupational medicine fit all of that and it ticked all those boxes um and also career progression its own specialty i didn't want to just enter a job and stay at the same level for 25 30 years i wanted to see if there's some sort of progression and yeah you know i it, it almost fell into it by accident um and um, maybe if we do go through my career history we can talk a bit more about that but um yeah it, it it just ticks so many boxes um and i think the people i've never heard of an, of anybody that goes into occupation medicine and then comes back out it's always the other way where they do occupation medicine and then they end up giving up or like letting go of some of their other portfolio aspects and and going into it full or part-time so it, it sounds like there's different ways in then because you said that you know maybe you can do your f1 f2 and then you can enter occupational medicine but you've also said that sometimes people do a variety of different things and then they enter, or sometimes people already have a CCT in something and then they enter. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the great thing about occupational medicine is that if whether you're doing a portfolio career, so some of the GPs that I come across want to do one or two days a week occupational medicine, some hate their specialty and couldn't think of anything worse than doing another day in what they've been, you know, either training in or looking towards, or they've realised that the opportunities actually aren't that easy and actually would require them to relocate, for example. And unfortunately, you know, some of the paediatric surgeons that I worked with in my rotations earlier on in my career, Career, they were moving around like crazy because obviously there's only a few areas that that actually have pediatric surgery as it, as a specialty in a, in a tertiary hospital for example um and uh you know that 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 kind of led um you know me to kind of um, look at all the other opportunities and I've, I've done other kind of conversations and talks but yeah you can do the traditional f1 f2 uh, medicine or gp st1 st2 even surgery st1 st2 or psychiatry and then apply for a training number as st3 with a you know a registrar post and a lot of people do that they don't really come outside the nhs they just go straight into like an you know a training programs um, registrar and then c CT at the end of it after SD6 but others look at it different ways some people are later on in their career they've had enough they just want to do um, you know the basic qualification occupational medicine practice as an occupational physician and see the rest of their working days out others you know they change their mind and I've heard of ST6 uh, ENT registrars I've heard of consultant anaesthetists come into occupational medicine so you know it, it really really varies and uh, you know um, that's the great thing there's so many entry points it's so flexible so um you know you really could do whatever you wanted with it um and uh you know it's a very attractive for that reason and it, it does help that it pays well as well so yeah. what, what what makes it an attractive career so I think, yeah, we, what, what we just touched on there, which would be things like the flexibility of it, the fact that it's its own specialty and niche. And I think some people really like to kind of own their specialty and they don't just want to be, let's say, a gen generalist. They want to specialise and become a subject matter expert. But also, I think for me, I you know, and speaking to other people, not only the work-life balance, but the fact that actually it's it's all almost out of the box thinking. Traditionally, from day one medical school up until when we start practicing as doctors, we're almost trained and thought and made to think in a certain way, and quite rightly so. But I think sometimes, you know, when you start to take a step back and look outside the box and think about other factors and and how you can apply yourself and what you're interested in, for example, law and legislation. I don't think I did a lot of that at all up until I entered uh, occupation medicine there's actually so much out there and you, you there's so many subspecialties rail diving aviation oil and gas so you know it really is just whatever you want it to be and I think that's the <laughs> the headline is that occupation medicine is a career whatever you want it to be it can be what you want it to yeah so give me an example of what do people do in their typical week then 
So um, it's it's obviously not involving on calls and weekends and nights. So that's the, the main kind of headline there as well. But um, you know, it's a, it can it's a nine to five or it's a part time, whatever hours you feel um, that you want to work. And I think most people, and I started nine to five Monday to Friday. Um, you would get typically about 45 to 60 minutes per person. So it's not a rushed um, kind of interaction with someone. You really do get to spend time with them, and really find out what's troubling them and really take a detailed history. Um, you can be remote. You can be in clinics. Sometimes they visit on sites and I've been to construction sites, uh, depots where the, the trains sleep at night. Um, you know, um, a, a, a massive kind of uh, factory that deals with uh, you know making planes and stuff. So it really varies what you can actually get involved in. Um, and um, you would spend that 45, 60 minutes and you would look at First of all, what uh, the fact that the managers refer them. So there's obviously a concern or a, a need for advice. Take a detailed occupational history, a clinical history uh, about their symptoms and how it's affecting the treatment and things like that. And then do something what we're probably not used to, which is more of a functional history. So how's it affecting their day to day? their activities of daily living, washing, dressing, cooking, housework, those kind of things. And try to place that in context with their work. And then finally, kind of, you know, basic examinations happen as well. So, you know, if somebody's got cognitive issues, I would, it wouldn't be untoward for me to do it like a mocker or, a, you know, an AMTS. Or, for example, you know, if someone's got lower back issues, just kind of do a basic kind of touching toes kind of thing. Um, and then um, beyond that, you, you would talk about your fitness for work. So you would do that 45 to 60 minutes. Um, typically, you could have six to eight cases a day. Um the reports right, uh, that you form at the end of it normally can be done within that time. But if not, or there's something else going on, or say, for example, you're at home and you need to pick up your children, it can wait. Um, you know, you can complete that report later on. Um, and, um, you know, once most of the time when you've seen them and you've done the report, you may not see them again. It's a one off advice, but sometimes you may see them again. Um, and, and that's kind of what the typical week's like. But it can vary. It, it depends what you do. If you are more management leadership, it might look slightly different. If you are more into kind of medicals and health surveillance, it may be slightly different. Or if you're doing kind of more pension assessments, it may be that you don't speak to anyone. You pop your headphones on and you just work as, as you wish to and, and, you know, in silence and in peace. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering with that report writing, do, do, is there potential for challenges there that, you know, because you, you, you will influence somebody's career or somebody's pay or can they work or can't they work? So it sounds like it's quite high stakes. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's not like medical legal reports. So, you know, and I want to make that clear. So, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, your report will be used to, let's say, you know, to determine whether some accident was caused by something or actually something was someone's fault or, you know, what the kind of implications are in terms of any sort of, uh, you know, civil case or, or settlement. But at the same time, the the reports are are asked, and, and and the main reason is that health and safety law and equality act law um, states that actually the employer has a duty of health and safety, and that has a duty not to discriminate against somebody's health. So, even though you're writing a report, actually the onus is on the employer so you know and ultimately all you're doing is giving your opinion and it can happen that employees don't consent for the report to be released because they disagree with you okay uh, and actually sometimes and it happens quite often the employer receives your lovely report that you've spent time doing and look takes one look at it and says no actually i disagree oh i don't want to do that or it's not feasible i can't i can't implement it so therefore i can't really do a lot of that um some of it has implications on the employee's employment okay um but more often than not it's more about working with the balance of work and health and trying to get them to work and try to get them to you know manage their symptoms manage their functional restriction in terms of work alleviate some of the manager's concerns um and uh you know al allow for things to progress you almost like let's say a problem solver you're forming a solution to a problem that's happened at work and somebody's health and something that's going on um and and, and that's often what it is it's a bit of negotiation but it's also a bit of 
problem solving and and it helps um i guess the only other thing about it is that you know if there was say a legal challenge and actually the employee felt that the employer was supposed to be doing something and wasn't and there's a health and safety issue or a risk of discrimination against their health for example ultimately an employment tribunal would decide whether it was or not and they do use the occupational health physician reports but ultimately as i mentioned before the the onus remains on the employer so you know it's it's up to the employer to defend themselves and they can say that they use an occupational health report for that but you know the challenges may come around that they may say okay well if you didn't like this report why didn't you get another one and etc etc so there is some risk but it's lower risk. It's not that you're going to get sued because you gave the wrong advice. You're only giving your opinion and you robustly justify based on evidence-based medicine or, you know, the information you have available uh, and your knowledge of medicine and knowledge of the law. So, yeah, uh, you know, that's a great question, you know, and a lot of people do get a bit edgy about it, but actually, you know, um, overall, um, you know, it's it's quite a quite quite a good position to be in because it's it's not you it's not your responsibility it's not your own but you are advising based on your expertise. And um, what kind of skills do you need? So um, I think having a good all round knowledge of medicine is important. So that's why um, you know even if you are applying for an ST position, ST three position, and applying for the training view, you do need kind of that um, you know two years post FY two. Um, uh, you know GPs and psychiatrists and things make good occupational health physicians, but having that all, all round knowledge, but ability to think outside the box and let's say relearn certain things that you've been conditioned over many years of medical school and, and practicing in hospital medicine um, and try to kind of think of things in a slightly different way from a functional aspect, from a, an ethical and law perspective, rather than, oh, this person has this condition and needs this medication and we need to check the bloods, we need to do another scan. It's it's quite quite different, so out of the box thinking. I think working autonomously is very important. So you are not often in a massive team on a ward round or in surgery theatre with everybody around you. You would need to be kind of on your own a bit more. But obviously there are clinics and there are lots of people around and there's support if you need. Great, you know, good a good grasp of English written language. So report writing is important and being able to explain things in a non-medical jargon um, is important and something that most people develop when they start entering into occupational medicine pretty quickly. Um, and then I suppose um, it's just uh, adaptability is probably the last thing I would say in the sense that, you know, sometimes you'll read um, a, a manager's perspective and then you've got the employee in front of you and actually things are very different and being able to adapt and negotiate the scenario and problem solve is, is one of the biggest things that we do. And if you do it really well, you end up having, you know, very little complaints, lots of uh, compliments and actually you know you're the go-to person you can help and point things out and give the information to the right people and let them progress the case in the scenario mm -hmm. um you mentioned there's different ways to get in and, and maybe if i if i if i think if there's a if there's a an early career doctor an f2 or an st1 thinking how how do they get in or if it's somebody who's a much more senior doctor how, how do they get in so, um, you know, there's three broad routes into occupational medicine. So um, you've got uh, the NHS training route, um, military, there's a lot of occupational physicians there. Um, but also you've got what we call the non-training and portfolio pathway, right? A lot of people um, can do the basic qualification, Diploma of Occupational Medicine, and that's it. They do it. They um, enter into the field. They practice occupational health physician. They don't do any exams or anything else, and they're quite happy and content. OK, other people who want to progress and they want to become a registrar and then end up becoming a consultant. You've got the, the, those three routes that I just mentioned. And um, the NHS training route, you would apply for a number. There's something called the National School of Occupational Health and they do interviews. So much like with most specialties, have some form of interview, some form of CV exercise. If you're successful, you get a training number and you're ranked across the country and then you can apply to certain areas. 
the good thing about occupational medicine is that there's actually a lot of industry posts for as well. So you can take your NHS training number and you can go to a company that doesn't operate in the in, in NHS. And you can if they're if they've got an approved training post, you can essentially train with them, which often happens. And, you know, for example, uh, Medigold and some of the other big companies, they have training posts that are approved um, by, by the GMC and by the Faculty of Occupational Medicine. And then there's the other route, the portfolio pathway, which is what I'm doing, which is very flexible. It's up to you how you want to do it. Essentially, the idea is that you gather evidence um, over four years, full time equivalent of what a registrar would do. And at the end of the four years, you submit it to the GMC. The GMC do the initial checks. They then submit it to the Faculty of, Faculty of Occupational Medicine and then once you get two green lights, you're essentially the equivalent of a consultant and you can call yourself a consultant. You join the specialist registrar. It used to be called the back door way, but actually it's not really that anymore. It's just an alternate way. Um, and depending on where you are in your career and what you're looking at, if you are about to have kids and you've got a young family, you may decide that the portfolio pathway is a bit better. It's more flexible. You can take breaks, for example, or you just stay at a DOP med level, for example. If you're later on in your career and the last thing you want to do is do more exams and CCT and whatever, then just stay at DOP med level. And um, there's also an intermediate level called AFON, which is where I'm at at the moment. And that's just when you've done the exit exams and you are essentially a staff grade equivalent. So you've got the knowledge of a consultant, but you haven't quite proved your competencies and become accredited specialist. Um, or you go the full whole hog. And a lot of people that are younger on in their career, they do want to progress to become a consultant. They've got the right resources around them and they're not afraid to do more exams and go for it. So, you know, it's really what you want to make of it. Um, one thing I'll say about the training post is that there is part time equivalents as well. So it's not uncommon for people to do, you know, like a, a an LF, uh, a, a LF uh, less than full time equivalent. OK. Um, and then there's um, others that, you know, decide that very late on. And, you know, there are registrars that are well into their 40s and 50s and they're happy, but they just want to be, let's say, tick boxed through the training rather than have all the responsibility of doing the portfolio pathway like um, like I'm doing, which you, it's almost on you and you have to be a bit more motivated to make sure that you gather the right evidence and get all the boxes ticked. I hope you're enjoying the show. Please click subscribe so you'll be notified when new episodes become available. This podcast is part of my mission to help doctors create successful and meaningful careers. You can be part of that mission too by forwarding this show to one person who you think might benefit from listening. Thank you. Now on with the show. How, how, how does one gain experience? You know, let's say you talked about the portfolio route if somebody's working in another area or in general practice. I mean, where, where do they go to find out what it's like and gain the experience they need? So there's quite um, there's several ways. I mean, again, you might need to take more initiative to find it. But every single NHS trust and NHS hospital has an occupational health department. I can guarantee you that they're probably short staffed to a degree. We all know what the NHS hospitals are like and how health and well-being is the forefront and focus at the moment. But there's a lot of doctors that become burnt out, stressed, but also all the other staff. And, you know, because we deal with patients and safety critical, essentially, stuff that we're doing on a day to day, the need for OH in NHS departments is huge. So I would rock up to your local hospital, find the occupational health department and say you would like to do some shadowing. Could you even help out and sit in some clients and even do some, um, you know, reports under the supervision of someone like a registrar or a consultant? That's a good way of doing it. The other way is um, going to somewhere like the sort of Society of Occupational Medicine and asking them if there's any kind of uh, ways of getting shadowing. The Society of Occupational Medicine has a massive list of um, private occupational health service companies that are willing to take people on. Um, for example, at Medigold, we do that as well. Um, and yeah, you can come in, have like taste a day or so and just see what it's like sitting with an occupational health physician ask those questions you know and see what it you know, what a consultation looks like see what the working day is like and you know what we do from like 8 30 to like 4 30 or whatever um and you know just gauge gain the experience that way so there are a variety of ways um 
watching uh you know watching this podcast is a good way as well get get a little bit of an idea but also there's talks that i've done for the royal college of physicians and society of occupational medicine with a career in occupational medicine where i do show what a report would look like and you know what of a typical day looks like so you're more than welcome to watch that and, and hopefully we can provide a link to that um and that might just give you a bit of a flavor as well but um yeah lots of different ways to do it um it's a growing specialty um unfortunately the old schoolers um are kind of and the consultants are starting to kind of let's say reach the end of their career and retire and there's probably not enough coming through the other end so actually right now it, you know there's a lot of scope for becoming an occupational health physician and a lot of companies in nhs training programs are jumping at the opportunity to get people into the field um and then the other thing just to note is that about i estimate about 75 to 80 percent of occupational medicine is outside the nhs is private occupational health services okay so it's one of those specialties where actually there's a you know if you can't get any luck for the nhs for sh shadowing or whatever you know reach out go outside of it and you'll see that there's a lot of opportunity around you how, how does this work that some of it is in nhs and a lot is outside of the nhs what does that mean for you as an occupation so, so there's kind of three types of occupational health uh in-house so a large company like i don't know a large bank or a large media company may have their own in-house um you know, occupational health department, a consultant, a nurse, um, administrative staff, and, you know, a few occupational health technicians or something like that. And they look after their own staff. And that's essentially what the NHS occupational health departments are. They look after their own staff. Some in-house occupational health um, um, do have external contracts. So you, it's not uncommon for an NHS department to look after, let's say, the security company of the hospital as well. And the ones that, you know, do like some of the, you know, say, uh, currying of like lab samples and whatever. OK, um, and that's not uncommon. Or some like, local NHS departments and the one that I look after has like local university and local teachers and things around the area who look to, to us to provide that. You've then got the private occupational health services company, which is a large company that looks after many employees and companies all around, from small to medium, medium enterprises to absolutely large ones. There are companies that look after, for example, Google, Barclays, BBC. There are other ones that look after slightly smaller ones, Morrison's, you know. So, you know, there, there are uh, there are those. And, um, you know, and, and it. It can split into different kind of niches, so rail industry, oil and gas industry, um, factories, um, you know, working with weird and wonderful chemicals and weird and wonderful biological substances um, and, and ones with vibration, ionising radiation. So there's such a such a broad variety. And then the last type of occupational health is independent. So if you get a good amount of experience, you're at the kind of A form or M form level, you may decide that you want to locum or also almost practice independently. And people will come to you for advice and they need, they have a specific case, they'll come to you and they'll ask you to do the assessment or small nurse led companies may ask you as the doctor to do some assessments for them. So that's the kind of broad picture. Um, and because the NHS is kind of in house and the actual majority of all of our industry and the economy is actually outside the NHS. It's not unsurprising that 80 percent or so, probably more than that, actually, is actually outside the NHS with occupational medicine. Tell me about these levels. You, you, you referred to different levels. Was it sort of M4 and A something? What, what are those levels? So if you do the portfolio pathway um, and, you know, with, with the NHS training program, you've obviously got the ST3, ST4, ST5, ST6, and then you CCT and become MVOM, a consultant, right? With the uh, portfolio pathway, you've kind of got three levels. You've got the DOC med, which is the basic, you're like a generalist, and essentially you get a diploma in occupational medicine and you practice at a generalist level. Um, I think normally with that and what the faculty occupation medicine uh, recommend is that you would you would have some form of senior, uh, let's say, contact or supervision when you're practicing at DR med level. If you do the MPOM part two exam and you do the exit exam, you've done all the exams, you can get the nominals AFOM, which is essentially you're an associate of the faculty of occupational medicine um that's at quite a senior level. The exams are pretty hard and obviously you've got the knowledge of a consultant, even though you haven't done 
steps to become accredited. Um, and that's kind of, let's say, the middle grade version. And it's a good level that a lot of people, because they don't want to go through to the whole training or submitting all the evidence to GMC. So they just want to do exams and get at a reasonable level. And then obviously you've got MFROM where you're an accredited specialist. And whether you do the portfolio pathway or the NHS training pathway, whether you CCT or CESA, you're still an MFROM. You're still a consultant. You're still on the specialist register for the MC. And then I guess the last one, which I'm sure most specialty have, is a fellow. So you couldn't become a fellow of occupational medicine when you've got a good level of experience and you contribute to the field and you get FFOM equivalent to FRCP or FRCGP or FRC psych, whatever. So, you know, there, there is that. And, and, and those are the kind of levels that you're at. OK. Um, and um, in terms of working then in the private sector and the NHS, so you know, in the NHS, we all we're all on national terms and conditions. We all have the NHS pension. We all earn pretty much the same, or we all work to the same band. So, how how do salaries work in the private sector then? So, um, as you can probably imagine, um, in the private sector, there's generally more resources, more money involved. We we charge slightly differently to the NHS. Um, so, you know, in general, uh, the income's more, and actually, you generally get paid a lot more. Um, it, depending on your experience and seniority, the, the, the salary ranges would differ. Um, I think, you know, it's not um, hard for you to find out what the NHS, um, uh, let's say, registrar ranges are in salary. You can find it from the BMJ or wherever you can do your Google searching. But as a general guide, to give you an idea, most um, private industry companies, um, if you're a DOC med level, can range something from like 80 to 85K full-time equivalent, um, but can go up to say like 100, 105, depending on your experience. And you could have done a master's or something or have a lot of experience. But if you're kind of at the A form, M form level, it's not uncommon to get into 100, 100 to 120 K range. And obviously, if you start becoming climbing up the ladder, like medical directors, chief medical officers, or like a senior consultant, uh, or, you know, you deal with this particular niche of occupation medicine. So you're quite a sought after commodity. Um, you know, you can really go for 130 to 150 plus. Um, it really is the sky's the limit. But obviously, uh, you know, you, you would take quite a few years and quite a bit of experience to get to that level so that's an idea i mean if you also wanted to say like locum um you know you can either do a per case rate so if one for for one 45 minute to to 60 minute you might have have a range uh, of price and I have to be a little bit careful because i don't want to set the price and get in trouble with the uh, bma and uh, you know cartel type thing but you know it, it, it's that you would it, you would obviously have to find you know, and make contacts and branch out and set up your own company or, or like have contacts with that. But yeah, it's not uncommon for a, a you know, a, a single, uh, you know, a single um, uh, uh, assessment to be charged at the rate what the private occupation health company would. OK, so it can rate, you know, two, three, four, five hundred or whatever, it, whatever. It depends, obviously, on what your experiences and what your um let's say the, the, the need for that assessment and how complicated it is um you can also go for day rates and it's not uncommon for recruiters to advertise um you know anything from kind of 800 to a thousand pounds a day you'd probably be expected to do quite a few cases in that day but you know you can do that and, and recruiters there's lots out there there's lots of occupational health recruiters as well as obviously the locum agencies that we get contacted about for, for hospital working so you know you feel free to kind of explore that and you know contact recruiters find out what the kind of going rate is um and you can always talk to you know and apply for roles uh for the private industry ones the big companies and ask you know what's the kind of salary expectation and what are you looking for um there's quite a lot of job specifications out there as well so you can start ticking those boxes and building your cv towards that um what are the most challenging aspects of the job so um I think negotiation is key. What often can happen is um, there's a uh, discrepancy or a misalignment of um, kind of perspectives between the employee and employer. And obviously you or yourself as an OHP are, you're impartial, you're outside the box and you're kind of coming to this fresh, but sometimes there's a lot of disagreement between the employer and employee and work-related stress and what's happened. Sometimes um, a challenge can be more to do with stuff like um, 
health and safety versus risk of discrimination against someone's health um and you know you know employers can find it quite difficult because they don't want to discriminate against that employee's health but they're worried about the health and safety of that employee in the environment but also the colleagues the wider public and what that could mean um I think some of the challenges um, can be obviously with complex cases and mental health. So having good experience with mental health, um, you know, practice is useful, um, but it's not impossible if you don't have a lot. But, you, you know, you can navigate you around a bit quick, um, a bit easier. Um, I think um, the report writing and the grasp of English language, if English is not your first language or you're generally not that great at wording stuff. That can be a bit of a learning curve. But again, not impossible to overcome. Um, and I suppose um, the other really is, um, and it, I found it, first of all, no one really knows what you do. That's one of the reasons why we do this podcast. There's a little bit of stigma that you get whenever you leave an NHS training or go to like a non-conventional route of practicing. And, you know, you do. And I did get a few kind of comments and questions asking, like, why are you leaving the NHS? Why are you doing this, etc.? cetera? Um, and that was a little bit of a challenge at the beginning. Um, but you know what, you have to prioritise work and health and quality of life at the end of the day. And actually, you know what, uh, you know, looking back at it now, I wouldn't change my mind at all. And actually, the people that were doubters are now asking me questions about what I do and how I'm doing it. And, you know, how have I got a, such a good work life balance? And, you know, how do I get into it? You know, and, and, and it, it does become like that. So, you know, going against the grain is a challenge and, and occupational medicine may be that because it's just not that well known, but it is becoming ever so, ever so known and COVID shone a massive light on that. Um, and, uh, you know, in a way, there's such a bad situation with COVID has helped the field. It has helped occupational medicine. We've really started to get our voice heard. And, and um, you know, I, I hope that challenge um, to become an OHP and, and uh, becomes less and less with, with stuff like this, like a podcast, talking, awareness and, and, and being able to, you know, enter the field and get trained up. It, it, it's interesting, you know, you talk about the people leaving the NHS because there's so many people that I talk to that people are really interested in, in whether it's portfolio careers or non-standard careers, we, we, we can call it what we want, but something other than the, than the NHS training conveyor belt, yeah, because, because the problem is, the problem that I see, and, and I'm old enough to remember the days before the conveyor belt, you know, the days where nobody knew what to do, and we all, we all, we all travelled, and we all did a range of different things, and then eventually we found somewhere that we called home, and and that mm. was celebrated. Whereas mm. sort of, like, I, I think that the the the, the programmes that exist at the moment are very much sort of shoehorning people onto a conveyor belt. You know, all of these things they get chopped off and disappeared, and a lot of people now are rebelling against that conveyor mm. belt career, and they are looking for for things that are not your standard NHS conveyor belt. No, you know, and there's so many new fields that are coming through pharmaceutical, digital health as well, for example, you know, there's a lot more out there. There's a lot of report writing that I've seen as well, which is another area that you can go to medical legal and stuff. But I think, I guess for me, the reason why I found occupational medicine so good is that you're not totally letting go of medicine and the interaction with people and taking histories and using medical knowledge. Um, you are still doing a lot of that. You still do come across, you still examine, you still will ask them and, and you will hear about their troubles that they're having because the NHS waiting times are so long, for example, and they're really struggling with work. And, you know, just that conversation about how they're dealing at home, they really appreciate it. And they, and, and on, on Honestly, they nobody gets 45 minutes to an hour with a doctor anymore, but they do with you and they really do appreciate that. So you get that satisfaction and, and you still get to use your knowledge. And I didn't want to let go of all of the experience that I had and go into something completely different, like run a business or something. I just I still wanted to to keep a hold of that training and still be a doctor, still be GMC registered, still appraise every year, still still have all of that. Um, but I didn't. You know, I wanted to go in a different way. I wanted to get the work life balance. And yeah, unfortunately, you know, and many people may disagree with me, but I feel I felt at one stage, but particularly, unfortunately, when the Jeremy Hunt and the junior doctor strikes and stuff happened around 10 years ago. That was my turning point where I said, like, actually, maybe I need to look outside the box and uh, I haven't looked back. And if somebody is miserable in their career, I really encourage you, first of all, to listen to this podcast, but also, you know, 
just look at occupation medicine, give it, give it a shot. Um, it, 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 you will be surprised at the flexibility and the work-life balance and actually how well, how much your experience to date is still valuable. It's still very, very valuable. And you can use that really well. That consultant anesthetist um, that I talked about does diving medicine and compressed air medical. So all of their knowledge about the physics of the body and Boyle's law and Charles law and all of this, they still use it and and they love it and they're really good at doing it. So, you know, you can, you can make it what you will. And, and, um, you know, I strongly encourage it. And it's, it's sad that it's happened to the NHS, but at the same time, you know, we've got to look after ourselves. We don't want to get burnt out. We don't want to regret our career after 25, 30 years. And I promise you, and this is a promise with occupational medicine, you will not regret that. Everybody retires happy. <laughs> That feels like a good place to um, finish our well I'm, I'm 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 convinced so thank you very much for time. <laughs> yeah no worries and as i said um, I, there are resources out there and do look at the links and uh you know if if i can be of any help you know drop drop me a line i'm more than happy on linkedin to to receive stuff and i'm i've helped a lot of people into the field and i hope to continue to do so so you know absolutely uh, you know go for occupation medicine is, is my advice Wonderful. Thank you very much. Nice.